Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome. Thanks for joining today's Flawless Execution webinar titled Debriefing Your Final Step to Agility. Today, we're going to start off discussing why debriefing is such a critical final step to any plan. We'll discuss the gaps between the goals that you set out to achieve and where you actually end up. And we'll close with an overview of the stealth debriefing process. That's our model here at Afterburner, which you can apply to every one of your future missions, no matter where you reside in the organization. As a reminder, the webinar slides will be available immediately following the live webinar on Afterburner SlideShare. You can find that link in the chat in the QA box now, and the video recording will also be available and sent out via email. So welcome. My name is Matt Brady. I'm a former U.S. Army soldier. HOBO is the call sign the Air Force assigned to me because we don't use call signs in the Army. It's a long story. We won't go into why I have that call sign here, but I did spend 18 years in the active Army, uh, both as a helicopter pilot for recon and special operations missions. And I also had the privilege of commanding special ops forces in both Iraq and Afghanistan. Uh, commanding organizations ranging in size from a small seven-person scout team all the way to a large, complex special operations task force uh, numbering in the hundreds. I've had the unique opportunity to be a part of some, some pretty fascinating events uh, over the last 18 years. One event in particular was called Operation Red Wings, which you might recognize the name. That was the operational title given to the Lone Survivor mission, uh, book and a movie. movie uh, has uh, some stars you might recognize, um, but uh, the real guy in real life that was the Lone Survivor is a man named Marcus Luttrell. He was a Navy SEAL, and I flew him into that mission and three other SEALs, and it ended up being a uh, tremendously um, uh, disastrous uh, set of circumstances, but one uh, that we really learned from as an organization, uh, as an army, and, uh, and as a special operations force. So tremendously developmental mission for me personally, uh, as well as professionally and for our institution. Um, graduated West Point, I uh, started to make a transition in my military career to more strategic development. And so to form the foundation of that education, I had the opportunity to attend the U.S. Air Force's Premier School for Strategy Education at a Maxwell Air Force Base, and also round out my strategic education with an MBA from Harvard Business School just last year. Uh, most recently, I had the great privilege of, uh, of working at uh, Airbnb out in San Francisco and working on their product team, uh, working for the, uh, the CPO, the chief of product out there. Fell in love with the organization and fell in love with San Francisco as well. South of Market area was beautiful and uh, really a, a fascinating company and a fascinating culture. All right, so let's talk about what we're focusing on today. Why debrief? Why do we do it? What is this thing that we're talking about with the execution gap? And what is our particular brand of debriefing, the stealth debrief? And we'll go through each of those points. All right, so let's talk about why we debrief. So why should we look backwards when we're constantly trying to talk about and improve and action the things that need done today? Who has the time to do that? Well, I would challenge that assumption and say, who doesn't have the time to debrief? Who doesn't have the time to innovate and improve and constantly stay ahead of the rate of change but we know, because we know the marketplace is changing faster than it ever has before? And it's changing from customer demands supplier demands, uh, the strength and number of competitors in our particular, in just about every industry, uh, specifically when I was working in the tech industry. I mean, that you, you'll see a new startup every day out in San Francisco. Each one is trying to get a bite of that market. So debriefing is a skill, and it's something that is a deliberate practice, and it's, the, it's really the only actionable way to move from where you are to where you want to be. So 
let me give you an example. If you've got a group inside your organization, you've got a team, they spend two weeks solving a problem. They really get through a lot of those pitfalls and they discover some of those pitfalls from uh, falling in them. You know, after about two weeks, they've, they've kind of uh, gotten to an approved solution and they've achieved their goal. And then group number two through six, a couple of months from now, has a similar mission and they all step in the same potholes and the same pitfalls. Have you ever been on one of those teams? I've been on a, I've been on a team number four that halfway through and pulling my hair out and trying to figure out where the traps are, what the secrets are, what the tips to success are, only to find out that a group did the exact same thing a couple of months ago and didn't spread the information, didn't share their lessons. Extremely frustrating position to be on as a contributor, as a team member, as a team leader, and especially as a, a strategic leader uh, at, the, at the enterprise level of any organization. So let's talk about the execution gap and what that is. So the execution gap is really just the difference between what you achieved and what you expected to achieve. When I was at Harvard Business School, I had a mentor of mine that really summed it up nicely in this equation. He said, this, he said the definition of success are the results you achieve minus the expectations. And you can apply that to anyone's vantage point. Think about that. The results you achieve minus what you or, or somebody else important to that outcome expected you to achieve. Quick example, the president of our company, Joel Thornib, he was in the market for a car a couple weeks ago. He went to the dealer, test drove this car, had a beautiful navigation system on the dashboard, and the sales, the sales person was doing a great job pitching this feature, and Thor asked him, how will this integrate? with my Apple device that I use every single day? And the answer was, well, it doesn't. It stands on its own. It's a, it's a unique and, uh, and uh, an effective product. It doesn't integrate with what you use every day. And Thor said, well, I'm not going to use it. And it's not an important feature to me. So think about who designed that feature in the, in the vehicle. The design team, would, I, I would imagine, would absolutely think they were successful in designing that piece of technology. The car company that they sold the idea, the design to, probably thought this was a tremendous hit. What a great success. Look at these results. All of these results, though, are from vantage points of people that aren't as important as that buyer is. And when the buyer sees it and is expecting something that integrates with technology that he uses in everyday life, and he doesn't see that in the results, it's not a success for him. So ask that question. In whose eyes are we successful, and where does it matter? So that's our gap, where we start, where we finish, and the difference between where we finish and what we set out to achieve, what we expected to achieve. That is the execution gap. So how do we close that execution, that execution gap? We do it through the debrief. So let's talk about that. Why is it important to close that gap? It may seem intuitive, right? We want to achieve what we say we want to achieve. Of course we want to close that gap. Let's, let's talk about it in detail. We want to stop repeating mistakes. A lot of great things happen along the way, on the way to our objective, but we, may, we make some mistakes, we fall short. And how do we learn as a team and as an organization and pivot from the things that we did poorly in the past, do them better in the future? We all make mistakes, and mistakes are going to happen. They're inevitable. What we don't want to do is repeat the same mistakes over and over again. There's nothing more frustrating to an organization than repeated, avoidable mistakes. We want to leverage the best practices. If we see success in one area of our team, we want to exploit that success, and we want to, we want to disseminate that and spread that throughout the company so that we are successful as an enterprise, not just as a small team. And execution gap meetings and debriefs are also a great way to stay on top of where we are in our journey. It communicates to everyone involved where we are, what's our trajectory, what our likelihood of success is at this stage in the game. And it's really about taking the temperature of those, of those sometimes annual objectives and seeing if we're on track to meet or exceed them. Okay, so in essence, a debrief is talking about what are we going to start doing, what are we going to stop doing, and continue doing. We've all heard that phrase before. But let me give you an example of where debriefing really would have been uh, a game changer. So I'm going to just relate 
a quick military story from my past. Uh, we were uh, uh, flying helicopters in Afghanistan on what you would call time-sensitive missions. So this was an organization called JSOC, the Joint Special Operations Command. You might know the name uh, of the commanding general a few years back, uh, General Stanley McChrystal. And JSOC's mission uh, objective was to remove enemy combatants from the battlefield in hopes of disrupting the larger enemy organizations that they, that they had an important role in. And so whenever we found these individuals through intelligence, you can imagine that when they were exposed, that exposure, that vulnerability wouldn't last for long. So we really had to act very quickly, and time was absolutely of the essence when we were going on these missions. Well, our helicopters were parked, serviced, um, and, and stored at an air base in Afghanistan. And the air base operated like any other airport in the world. It had very busy runways. It had multiple aircraft coming in and out, cargo, passengers, military, civilian, government officials, a sprawling base. So uh, you can imagine what Atlanta uh, International looks like. Uh, this was very similar to that in terms of busyness and speed. When we had these time-sensitive missions, believe it or not, we couldn't get out of the traffic pattern in, in time. We couldn't take off at the designated time that we said was necessary to, to action this very timely target because we couldn't get permission from the tower to move ahead of five cargo planes that were on their way back to somewhere in Eastern Europe. And this was, this was mission impact, and this was a critical error that kept occurring uh, a few nights. We said this is, this is unsustainable, this is not consistent with what we owe our organization, we've got to debrief this. And so we did, we found out what the cause was, we found out the root cause, and uh, invariably the root cause was a difference in nationalities and command structures that allowed decision makers that were releasing the traffic to work ultimately for the government of Afghanistan, not for the U.S. government. So we were not aligned in our objectives, we were at least we're not aligned in our chains of command. So the solution to it was for the small team that started to discuss, you know, come up with the best uh, ideas to, to close this execution gap, their idea was to send a uh, skilled individual in negotiation, skilled in the art of influence and persuasion, and position them next to the tower operator every time we had one of these missions. And we found that when, we did that when we did that, our chances of success exponentially rose to almost 100% of getting out the door on time. So this was a example of a best practice that we had to quickly leverage and quickly communicate to the other helicopter crews and, helic and, and equipment that were coming later that month and later that year. And had we not known that, had we not shared that information, we would have kept making that same mistake over and over. So let's talk about the stealth debriefs. debrief. Step number one is setting the time and the place. Huge opportunity to communicate to your team, your organization, that debriefing is a priority. Uh, we spoke with numerous CEOs that tell us, I want to make this a priority, but it's just not resonating with our, with our group, with our team. And, and we would ask them, well, are you scheduling it? Do you have a time and a place that you mark down that you ensure you do it every single time? And so, well, no, it's just kind of something that happens after the execution is over. Well, there's your root cause. You're not setting a time and a place and being deliberate about getting that in people's workflows inside their calendars to ensure that this happens. We can't communicate our priorities any clearer than how we spend our time as an organization. And so this is a critical way to say to your team, look, I know we're gonna have errors. I know we're gonna fail along the way. And I'm gonna set a time and a place and I'm gonna put it in the calendar for us to debrief this upcoming mission because I know there will be errors based on the risks that we take. And that, I will tell you, is an incredibly empowering thing to say to a team. Look, I know we're going to make mistakes, informed, educated mistakes, but I'm going to underwrite them as your leader, and we're going to talk about them in the debrief. Tremendously freeing and uh, is really, in my mind, the critical, critical step to allowing your team to be innovative, to think strategically, and to take risks. Setting the tone. A lot of the executives we talk to you say, I'd love to do debriefs, but people just don't want to hurt each other's feelings, right? People don't want to get in front of uh, each other and, and talk about their shortcomings. And, I, and we say back to those executives, yes, that's true, but they also don't want to get up in front of you 
and stay where they fell short. Who wants to talk about their errors to the people that hire and fire, sign people's paychecks, talk about personnel decisions? So I said that may be one topic, that may be one concern that they're afraid of, of being vulnerable to each other. But more importantly, they don't want to talk truthfully in front of you because you're the boss. And so the setting the tone right up front is extremely important. We call this a nameless, rankless tone. Execution versus objectives. Results minus expectations. This is where we look at the execution gap and we say, hey, how exactly far are we off the mark? What did we say we were going to do and where do we currently stand? And then we break that apart. We break those results into bite-sized pieces and we analyze them for the causes and for the root causes. Now, if you stop at analyze and you call that a debrief, all you've really done is written a history paper. You've just written a report on retrospectively what occurred. It's not a debrief until you take those insights gleaned from the analysis and you actually convert them into lessons learned, actionable steps that are going to take the insights and change behavior next week. So lessons learned is an actionable, specific list of don't do this, do this instead, and passing that off to the next team. And then we have to transfer those lessons. It does no good to say you're a learning organization if only one of your teams in a silo is learning and everyone else is waiting on results or making those same mistakes. If you don't transfer those vital lessons, if we didn't transfer those lessons about our takeoff techniques, we would not have been a learning organization. We still would have been siloed and we would have been improving one silo at a time. And that's just not, it's not time effective and it's not efficient. Lastly, ending on a high note, this is your chance to advertise to your group your next debrief. The last thing you want to do is make the debrief the worst part of someone's week. Why? Because the next time you do a debrief, less people will show up. Oh, hey, I had a doctor's appointment. Sorry. Oh, no, you know, I got a call with a client. I'd love to make, but maybe next time. And the longer this goes on, the less participants you have, and pretty soon you don't have anyone to debrief. So this is where you end on a high note and you talk about the reasons why we're doing this as an organization and why we're doing it uh, individually and how this helps at all levels. And this is really where you try to really try to get people back in the door and understand that this is a beneficial tool and not one to cast blame on everybody. All right, so let's talk about setting the time and the place. So hugely important, setting the time and the place you need to determine who's going to attend. Maybe it's a two-hour debrief. Maybe it's an hour debrief. It can be remotely dispersed. It can be a remote debrief. That's fine, but I really highly recommend that you don't just do it over the phone. Use a WebEx. Use something like WebEx where you can share notes and you can, uh, you can have uh, some visual explanations uh, along with the verbal explanations. That feels we found it feels more like a much more compelling meeting uh, as opposed to just a phone call, which is much easier to dismiss. And while you're on that, you know, you need to assign pre-reads to the group as well. I've tried to read slides and listen at the same time, and I will tell you, I do not think it's possible. So if you are going to send out material that folks need to read, do that beforehand. Make sure everyone coming to this debrief is ready to participate through listening and contributing and not try and not muddying the waters with reading the slides and not listening and then re uh, conversing things that have already been discussed because people weren't really engaged. You want to determine your debrief focus points. What are the three questions that we want to have answered by the end of this briefing? We don't want to presuppose those answers. That's what the debrief is for, but we do want to make sure that we've identified what those focus points are that we really want to solve from a root cause perspective when we walk out the door. Setting the tone. We've got to start with ourselves when we set the tone. As I mentioned before, executives are saying, look, I don't have buy-in from a lot of my team, and the reason they don't is because no one wants to stand up and say, here's where I, where, here's where I messed this up. So how do you combat that? You start with yourself. You look at your team, you say, here is where I fell short in my role as your ace, as your team leader. Here's where I could have made things easier, more effective, 
I should have done X instead of Y, and start with yourself to model the behavior that you're looking for. We call that inside criticism. And we've got outside criticism. The outside criticism is pointing to your team members and saying, how could I have done a better job? Dave, what could I have done better? Mary, tell me how I could have been a more effective team leader for you and enabled you to complete your submissions and your subtasks. And this is a vitally important part of the debrief because now you're demonstrating, you're modeling how to take the criticism that you're receiving. And if you start folding your arms, you start show, exhibiting those, those signs and symptoms of defensiveness, guess what your team's gonna do when you start criticizing them later on? The exact same thing. So this is where you show them what right looks like and you really have a chance to communicate how the debrief is going to go by how you react to criticism yourself. So that's what setting the tone is all about. E in stealth, execution versus objectives. This is again the difference between results and expectations. We wanna start out restating the mission objective and we don't wanna just say it in front of the team because everyone just nod their heads, right? Get a team member to restate the mission objective. If they can't articulate it, there's your, your problem, or at least one of your problems. No one had a clear understanding or agreement on what the mission objective was. That's crucially important to your understanding as to how and why things happened, why you succeeded, or why you fell short. So now that we have the results, we're gonna look at the finer points of those results. Let's analyze those actions. Why did errors or successes occur? First thing we'll do is ask how. How did it occur? What's the cause? And then we'll look for the root cause by asking why did that occur and asking why five times. Let me give you an example of when we did this in the military. I was part of a force in the Iraqi desert that was using tanks to drive uh, all the way to Baghdad. Uh, this was March of 2003. And we had probably about seven or 800 miles uh, to, to put behind us to get all these tanks up to, up to the, the capital city. Uh, you're looking at a force of about 20,000 people, hundreds and hundreds of tanks, moving pieces, lots of rolling equipment, uh, but the tanks were definitely the, the, the main uh, piece of equipment that we were relying upon. Well, one of our tanks in my unit, my particular unit, uh, which was a cavalry unit, so we were scouts out front, one of our tanks drove over a bridge and the bridge collapsed. In essence, separating our two forces and splitting them right down the middle. So obviously that wasn't in the plan, that wasn't something we expected to happen. We had to look at that and ask ourselves, how did this tank fall through this bridge? Well. Maybe the takeaway is don't drive tanks over bridges. Well, that, that doesn't seem reasonable. So we found out that this particular bridge wouldn't hold the weight of a tank, of, of a multi-ton combat tank. And so, okay, that's the how, that's the cause of how it happened. Now let's get to the root cause. Oh, and before you get to the root cause, when you have a tank that's disabled, ordinarily what you will do is get a wrecker vehicle, uh, we call them uh, uh, M88 wreckers in the Army, and you'll just strap the wrecker up to the tank and drag it out of whatever it's stuck in. Well, we couldn't do that either, and we didn't know why. So we had to find the root causes. So the root cause of the tank falling through the bridge is not the bridge is too weak. The root cause is we hadn't identified effectively all the bridges that wouldn't sustain that amount of weight. And if we did identify which bridges couldn't sustain that weight. We didn't pass that to the lowest levels of the force, and so they didn't know where to drive and where not to drive. And that was the root cause of that failure. Now, the failure in terms of not being able to extract the tank, we kept asking why could we not attach the record vehicle? Why were we not able to get the tow bar and the cables lined up and connected? And what it finally came down to after five levels of root cause analysis was that the tank we were using was a local tank from the area that we had positioned there in case of emergency use, which this was, and it was not the tank that we used at home, not the same type of tank that we used at home. So the piece of equipment, the bolt that we needed to extract off of the, one of the wheels that you connect the record to, our crews, our team did not have the tools adequate or the right size for this particular type 
uh, of road wheel on this particular tank because it wasn't the one we trained on. So the root cause was a bolt, a $10 bolt was something that we could not turn because we did not have the right tools because we had not challenged our own assumptions and saying that the tanks we get overseas will be the same tanks we use at home station. And that assumption was false and it was never challenged. So what did we do? We ended up blowing up the tank in place. That's a $6 million loss for a $10 million bolt that we couldn't get off, all because we didn't analyze uh, where we were in the planning process and how it deviated from reality that we were going to see on the ground. So now that you've analyzed the execution, you've established a cause and a root cause for each error or success. We're not done there because that's just a retroactive history lesson. We've got to identify and create and build effective lessons learned, specific action steps that we can use to change behavior on our team from this day to the next. And then once we've established and created that list, we need to transfer that, transfer those lessons to the right parts of the organization that need that knowledge. If you don't do that, you're just learning in silos. And then finally, ending on a high note. You've got to get people back in the room for the next debrief. You've got to market and advertise for that next event and reinforce to everyone on the team that this is to better the organization and to better you as a professional. And if you sell it right, you will get increases in your participation instead of attrition. All right. So let's talk about key takeaways, why you should always debrief. It is critical, it's critical in Agile. Agile constantly reminds us that we have got to continue uh, reflecting on our performance and informing our future, uh, our future missions based on our reflections. And Agile also tells us that we've got to pivot. We've got to know when conditions have changed enough that we've got to alter the plan and when that point in time is and how we can do that. And the only way you do that is through debriefing and taking a close look at how things happened and why they happened. You've got to close that execution gap, that distance between what you thought you'd achieve and what you actually achieved. That success, that equation, right? Success equals results minus expectations. Where are we now? Where are we thought we'd be? How do we take actions to close that gap and get closer to our target? And then finally, the stealth debriefing process. Remember, you've got to set a time and a place. You've got to set the tone. You've got to restate the objectives and compare that to the results that you attained, uh, your, your execution results, and then assess that gap. You've got to analyze that execution, both successes and errors, and determine how they happened and why, why, why? What is the root cause behind all those results? Transfer those lessons learned to those who need it and end up on a high note. High five your team on the way out because this makes everyone better in the end. So if you're interested in strengthen, strengthening your debriefing skills, check out Afterburner's new Accelerator Academy. Accelerator Academy brings the tools of flawless execution to you on demand to skill-specific e-learning videos, downloadable guides, checklists, and there's a whole bunch more on that site as well. Click the link in the chat in the Q&A box now to discover the ways you can accelerate your performance on your own schedule at your own pace. And at this point, you can contact me, contact us here at Afterburner. You can see my information there on the screen, and I think I see some questions coming in, so I'll turn it back over to our webinar producer, Ansley, and we'll start out with Q&A. Thank you, Matt. Our first question is, oftentimes we do get the insight or the lessons learned, but it's too late. How do we assure that the lessons learned are spread quickly enough through the organization? Yeah, that is such a great question. Sometimes. We, we come to these realizations and we get these insights and there, there just isn't enough time to, uh, to insert them in the plan for them to have a meaningful impact. And there's nothing you can really do about that except, uh, except include those in the, in the debrief. Um, and so when you're debriefing, talk about you know, the insights and the new information that entered that would have allowed you to develop more compelling, more uh, effective courses of action and identify that in the debrief and say, well, 
what would have allowed us to come across this information earlier where it could have been effective when it because it was so time sensitive is that something that's uh, a, a uncontrollable threat or is that something that we could have influenced and potentially had that information earlier had we done X Y and Z so um, I would really dig into why that information was late in getting to the to the show and then adjusting our behavior uh, because of that to try to extract that information information earlier. And at the very least, it'll remain uh, a resident part of that mission in the debrief comments that these were, these were pieces of information we needed to know, and that will help the next team that accomplishes or attempts to accomplish that same mission. Who best leads the debrief? The person who led the mission, the participant of the mission, an officer back somewhere else? Yeah, so you know, this is a leader-centric model. So the goal of debriefing is to get to the truth. That's the goal. You want to get to the absolute bare-bones truth of what, how, and why things occurred. And the only way you're going to get to that level, the only way you're going to peel back that onion is by demonstrating those behaviors yourself as a leader for everyone and modeling that and taking risks yourself inside the debrief room. Now, one thing you've got to ensure you do to, to, to make this a uh, protected environment is you've got to explain to everyone at the beginning that this is a non-attributional situation. This is where we're going to have some, some pretty uh, lengthy and uh, difficult conversations in this debrief, and I'm going to start this out as the leader by by making myself vulnerable and debriefing myself in front of everyone. And now I want you to debrief me on how I did. So you very quickly establish that tone right up front. Uh, it can be led by really no one other than the ace. If the ace just isn't available, it's always great to have kind of a deputy, you know, someone that, that you are, are grooming as, a, as an up-and-coming leader. And, and that's, that's incumbent upon all of us as leaders is, is looking throughout the organization, identifying those folks that are really exhibiting uh, the willingness, the aptitude, the ability to become part of the next cohort of leaders in your organization. So making one of uh, those individuals an understudy is, is tremendously important in their development, and it also helps out for when the ACE isn't available for them to lead the debrief uh, in your absence. Should we review the execution gap equation that you showed as a group? You know, the equation is really just, I think, a more intuitive way of thinking about uh, step number three in the stealth debrief process. So if you remember, the E in stealth is uh, execution versus the objectives. And that's really the equation, right? So success is results or execution minus objectives, which is your goal. And the difference between the results and your goal, that's the E in stealth. So that just helps me, that, that uh, equation helps me just kind of keep in mind, um, you know, how can I be successful and in whose eyes am I being successful? But uh, at the end of the day, I wouldn't use that, that equation uh, specifically in the debrief. I would just let the stealth process take care of that for you, and it will. Once you get to execution versus objectives and then the analysis step, then you're dealing directly with that equation. How do we encourage our leader to structure a post-project review like the stealth debrief? So that's a great question, and this is part of leading and managing up, right? So if, if this is, you know, if you're an individual contributor, and this is something that you want to incorporate in your organization, but you, you just don't have any kind of uh, managerial level of, of support or maybe even awareness, um, then, you know, you can lead from below. And, and this is uh, something I've had, I've had to do in my career as well. You're taking your manager, your boss aside, uh, and, and just starting to use some of the common lexicon. Hey, uh, I'd like to debrief with you, uh, Pam. Uh, the, the, the phone call that we were all on last week. You know, I'd really like to sit down and talk about what went well, what didn't go so well, and then draw out some lessons learned. 
And uh, and when you you know when you get to that uh, when you get that meeting uh, and you sit down and just kind of laying out well let's talk about first of all where I could have done a better job let's talk about what actually happened and then is that good or bad and and let's talk about how we do things differently next time and and you know when you start making it a habit with those around you they start picking up the habit too so I can't think of a better way of uh, of of spreading this type of behavior of of influencing folks and just by exhibiting it yourself and, and, tr and try, trying to find opportunities to showcase how you're thinking about things in a very clinical, structured way. And, uh, and you know, that, that's going to be great for you individually and uh, it's actually be great for your organization. So that, I think that's a great position to be in. Where do we actually keep the lessons learned so everyone can see them? Yeah, what a great question, and this differs from organization to organization. Um, you know, there there are various forms of uh, of databases, right? So it can be it can be a physical database that you maintain, and we had such a database uh, in, in JSOC in the Army. It was um, proprietary, but it was very very powerful in that you could enter in keywords into a search bar, just like in Google. And it was a high probability that the most uh, relevant information, the most relevant lessons learned would populate uh, with the correct, uh, you know, input of keystrokes. So that was, that was our, um, that was our system. It was a, it was a pull system. So you had to go to the database and ask for the information and pull that out. If you don't have that yet, you can use a push system, right? And that comes in the form of, uh, standard operating procedures and adjusting policy and, and uh, you know connecting with the team through uh, you know we were working with a tech group in New York City the other week and they've got uh, a weekly newsletter they sent out to all the team members called the closing bell and it talks about best practices lessons learned how to adjust behavior on common tasks common missions and so that's their uh, technique that's their method of 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 translating lessons learned, uh, transferring lessons learned, and getting them to the people that need it. So uh, a push system or a pull system, it can be either one, There and there are a wide variety of, of ways to actually go about uh, setting those up, uh, all sorts of different technological solutions. Do high-level execs need to be part of the debrief if they weren't very involved with the mission? So my answer to that is, is yes. The executives of the organization, the enterprise level leaders, set strategy for the company. And if you look at the opposite end of the organization to the folks actually rowing the boat, hands on the oars, m making things happen, you know, that's obviously the very tactical end of the mission objective, the very tactical end of the organization. The strategic leader needs to know whether the tactics being utilized on the front lines of the company are achieving the results needed to realize that strategy. So I had a great professor while I was earning my master's in military strategy uh, with the Air Force, and I remember he opened up the very first class by saying, strategy depends on a theory of success. Strategy depends on tactics achieving the results that are necessary to accomplishing that strategy. If that doesn't work and those tactical uh, events and accomplishments and results aren't happening, then it's a poor strategy. So if you are a good strategic leader, if you are a good enterprise level executive of any company, you are obligated, in my opinion, to attend the debrief sessions at the very cutting edge of any problem. And that's gonna be at the very tactical edge because you wanna see that the battles we being waged on the ground are supporting the overall war. And if there's a disconnect, that's where you really start having organizational problems. And that's, in my opinion, where the survival of the organization is really in peril. Please expand on debrief focus points. Sure, so debrief focus points, if you can imagine uh, your range of results that you achieved through your mission, and each one of them lies somewhere on the spectrum of success and error, right? Maybe, maybe some are more successful than others. Uh, you know, other, 
um, actions uh, were, were more erroneous than others, right? But they lie somewhere on that spectrum. Depending on how long your mission is, if it's a quarter, if it's a half a year, if it's a year-long mission, like with some of the clients we're working with now, you, you can only pick a certain number of key results that you want to focus on to understand why those results happened. And, be, and what's implicit in that is that those key focus points, when we really nail down the causes and the root causes of those focus points, that's going to move the ship uh, uh, by a larger degree than by tackling the rest of the uh, 97 or 96 other, other um, uh, debrief points. So it's really just a way to prioritize what you talk about and the time you have available and getting the most bang for your buck. So the debrief focus points is a prioritized list of results that you want to talk about and find out why they happened. And we have time for one last question. When debriefs start out positive and structured from the leader and then become more negative, not defensive, do you have suggestions or examples of how to fix this or steer the conversation? This happens all the time, especially with an organization that's just starting to incorporate debriefing into their culture. Um, and it's like anything else. It hurts at the beginning. When you haven't worked out for three years and you finally start going to the gym fairly hard, you're going to be pretty sore. And so there are some, uh, some definite growing pains, developmental pains, that go along with your first few debriefs. So if you haven't done them yet in your organization, you will, you will encounter this very scenario you're talking about. They will start out structured. They will start out uh, civil. And very easily and quickly, it will devolve potentially into finger pointing, into the you know into some defensiveness. But negativity can can definitely start to take root and start spreading throughout the conversation. And what I've done in the past, both as a debrief participant and as a leader, is I've taken a step back, and I've 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 taken the floor back for about five minutes, and I asked my team, why are we all why are we all here today? Let's get back to the why. Let's get back to the purpose of this debrief. And so we'd restate the mission objective. And then I would start talking about things that we agreed upon because obviously we had devolved to a place where we were looking for differences, looking for points of disagreement. And I very much wanted to shift their perspective that, look, we've got more points of intersection than we do divergence. We've got more things we agree on than disagree on. So let's remember that and let's think about how these differing points uh, how these diverging opinions impact the mission, if at all. And a lot of times you'll find that the differences between one person's opinion and another person's opinion does not really impact the mission all that much. And so if you can get people to agree that, look, we're going to table this, maybe we'll put it in the park, on the parking lot board, you know, something to discuss after the debrief, but, you know, if you can get them to, to at least agree to, to take that conversation out of the debriefing room or get them to understand that this is not going to be a critical insight to the future accomplishment of these types of missions, um, then I think that's probably your best bet. All right, I think we're out of time. Uh, and so at this point, I want to thank everyone for, for tuning in uh, to the webinar. Really look forward to talking to everyone again on the next one. And uh, again, and you can go to our website at afterburner.com uh, where you can see these slides and you can see other webinar slides and you can uh, see where we're going to be having, where and when we're going to be having our next one. So thanks for tuning in and we will catch you next time.